Hello, Blogging Heads Nation. This is the pre-State of the Union edition. I guess if we were really clever, it could be the State of the Union countdown edition. Um, this is Heather Hurlbert at the National Security Network. Uh, if it's countdown, shouldn't I like look at the you know the uh, the the screen dramatically and take off my glasses or something? But um, oh, damn! And I even have my glasses today. I could have done that. Oh well. Um, but yes, it is the the pre-State uh, of the Union countdown. Uh, I'm Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at Tufts University, and I blog at foreignpolicy.com. So um, our opening gambit here is uh, foreign policy in the State of the Union. Will it appear? And my guess is paragraph 38 um, of a 40-paragraph uh, State of the Union, um, which, which is to say I assume it's, it's if it's going to be mentioned at all, which it probably will be because it, it usually is, but it's going to feature very, very low on the totem pole. Um, and this is of a piece with, with something I blogged about recently, which is, you know, the Obama administration has obviously suffered some significant political setbacks, and my understanding is there are some people in D.C. who now are of the uh, belief that, you know, the, the natural thing to do when presidents face uh, domestic policy reverses is to start looking at foreign policy as a sort of salvation, as a way to, you know, to uh, boost one's uh, political bona fides. I think in this particular situation, that's not going to work at all, um, in large part because when the economy is this sour, um, the last thing a president wants to be seen as doing is focusing on foreign affairs. Because, let's face it, most of foreign policy seems very far removed from the concerns of ordinary voters, and so a president who focuses on foreign policy is going to be seen as far removed from the concerns of ordinary voters. So I agree with you on the general point and actually disagree with you on the specifics of the State of the Union for, for the following okay. following couple of reasons. Um, you, it's only, I mean, it's a month yesterday since the underwear bomber incident. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, frankly, I prefer the I'm, name Captain Underpants for the record, but go ahead. Uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm good with yeah. that too. And, you know, frankly, I think the quicker that recedes from memory, it's the better because A, it failed. B, even had it succeeded, it would have been very, very unfortunate for the couple hundred people involved and their families, but it would not in any way have posed a significant threat to the to the fabric of American life. And, you know, as Fareed Zakaria said, basically the hysteria over it allowed it to succeed in every way except the body count. And the sooner, the sooner we get away from that, the better. But it remains the case that between that and um, the ongoing conflict in Afghanistan, there has to be a significant swath of the speech devoted to national security, and there will be. And um, as someone who has had the pleasure slash um, pain um, of, of working on one of those in the past, there are basically two ways that you can do it, and either you slide it in toward the top or, as you said, you slide it in toward the bottom. And in this case, though, what I think will happen is that there will actually be an, an attempt to make a direct connection between um, sort of jobs and the domestic economic front and the international economic front and what the administration has done to, you know, frankly, keep us out of a worse global depression and try to put us back on a, on a sound footing globally with the economy and then transition from that to the security issues. That's my, that's my reading of the pre-speech tea leaves, but, um, you know, I've only got one source, and so who knows? It could, it could be completely different by now. So, okay. so I think... Um, you know, on the one hand, foreign policy wonks all sort of lie in their beds at night dreaming of a state of the union that's entirely about national security, and that's never, ever, ever going to oh, happen. God, that's care. hot, Heather. Keep going. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, you see, you see what I mean? It's totally... It's, there are a few bipartisan fantasies that, <laughs> that unite foreign policy wonks of all stripes and, like, you know, in the, the sort of... the when when. When when Playboy puts out an international <laughs> diplomatic edition, this will be one of the things that's in it. Um, you know, really like large breasted women whispering into the ears of, of you know, distraught foreign policy theorists while they write paragraphs for the State of the Union. Um but that's never going to happen. I don't care who the president is. But at the same time, this idea that sort of the alternative of that will happen and there'll be no news made on national security is also Never going to happen, and it's double never going to happen while we've got, you know, t troops engaged in two wars. No, I, I mean, I, I agree with you in the sense of it's not, I, I don't mean to say that foreign policy is not going to be mentioned. I, I mean, I, I, you're right. It's, a, it's sort of a prerequisite um, for what has to be done. And you've obviously got better sources than I do on this. But let me ask you a question. I mean, politically, given the state of the country and also given the state, you know, I'm, I'm sure you read the Pew uh, poll that came out uh, in December, you know, the, the logical connection, and, and Obama made this to some extent in his big Afghanistan speech, was to, I mean, the logical connection between the state of the economy and foreign policy would be the following. It would be to say, look, we're in a serious hole. 
Um, you know, we're in a serious recession. Um, we recognize, you know, the need to focus inward uh, in order to be able to rebuild our economic strength. And part of my foreign policy going forward will reflect that in the sense of we're not going to get involved too much overseas. We're, you know, we're not going to stick, you know, create too high a profile. We're obviously going to finish what we started in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, but this would clearly be of a piece with his pledge to continue the Iraq withdrawal regardless of what happens in that country and also the idea of a short timetable with regard to the Afghanistan operations. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, Dan, um, because, of course, that what you just laid out is the thing that our that our good friend Chris Preble and the, the Cato guys, right. you know, dream of. Yeah. And, and that's not going to happen women. either, um, because it would seem like a public admission that there are constraints on what we can do, even though, you know, you and I, of course, would agree there that are there are massive on constraints what we can do. Yes, exactly. on what we can do. So, so instead, I think, you know, what you're... What your job is as a president, and this again is actually sort of, sort of regardless of, of, of party, is to signal to use the speech to signal what your priorities are. Yeah, oh, of course. Um, you know, which is which is sort of the, the flip side of, of making the case that that you that you just made. But then I think you know there's there's another piece, and if, if memory serves, this is a place where we've tangled a bit in the past. Is that you know, in point of fact, our economy can't recover unless the global economy recovers. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, a big a big part of how quickly and in what directions our economy recovers has to do with what the future of the economic relationship with China looks like. Um, The question of green jobs, which I would guess they will dwell on to at least some length in this speech, is is not not solely a a domestic question. And and there's you know, there's a link there as well. So I think, you know, the the funny thing is that this classic trope um, and I, I can't help it. I'm gonna. This classic isolationist trope actually doesn't really work at all anymore. And I, I credit these guys with not wanting to explicitly say we have to do less abroad so we can do more at home. When in fact, some of what you need to do at home, you've got to do abroad as well. So it's hard because we don't have we don't have a trope for that in our in our politics. We don't have a shorthand for it that immediately communicates to people. No, and, but, I, 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 and I take your point. That might be why it's not a great political sell. Although, I mean, for, all right, first of all, I'll defend Chris Preble and others. I, I mean, there's a difference between, you know, pure isolationism and what would one would, you know, consider retrenchment from overexpansion. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure where Chris would fall. And I grant you some no, people it, are... I don't even like to use the word yeah, for yeah. exactly that reason, actually. I think it's it's of use only as a cheap straw man for, for lazy intellectual thinking, because there are really very few pure isolationists running around. But it's, actually, there is another purpose for it, which is it's politically a great thing. You know, it, it's like when free traders will, you know, dredge up the memory of Smoot-Hawley if they want to accuse, you know, someone uh, who's imposing a trade restriction of, of being a protectionist. I mean, there are certain political tropes, you know, and, and a lot of, there are certain political tropes that, that will always manage to resonate. They'll always, you know, generate a lot of media attention. If you accuse your opponents of being isolationist, that's one of them. Um, so I, I don't mean to say you were doing that, but I, I mean to say that it, <laughs> right. it does lead someone open to that charge. Um, I think the China example that, that you raise is certainly interesting because I actually that's actually one area where my concern would be that, you know, let's face it, we've had a whole series in the last six weeks of bruising battles with China um, on global warming, on um, the, uh, the, the Google cyber attacks, um, you know, continued uh, uh, protectionist sentiments, and, and then there's the whole business about the dollar. That's actually somewhere where I could see Obama trying to talk tough in a way to sort of rally people around him. And, you know, my guess is he would get reasonably bipartisan support if he pursued that course of action. Yeah, but I don't I don't think they will actually. The the China policy okay. is is interesting. We were just we were just actually writing about this in in here in the office yeah. at, at NSN that um that China is really in the first year of this administration it, it, you know is the dog that didn't bark. Every administration for the last what 20 years has had kind of a stupid China crisis its first year. Yeah. And we actually got through the first year without one which considering the economic position we're in is you know probably a good thing although one can quibble with and be unhappy about some of the human rights choices, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Then, as you say, in the last six weeks, we had this spate of really difficult issues with China. Although, two things. One is I would the, – the thing about global warming that's so interesting is if you take Congress's view into account and if you look at U.S. policymaking on global warming as a combination of what 
the executive branch says it wants and what Congress says it will countenance, you actually end up with a position that's really much closer to China's than it is to the Europeans' position. And, you know, there's a crazy irony um, from, a, from a pure climate perspective, of course, you know, if you care about the health of the planet more about than anything else, that's very frustrating. However, if we're stuck with that anyway, the question then becomes diplomatically, you wish we could make more use out of that. Because in, in point of fact, and, and this is something that is kind of dismaying considering how advanced our society and our economy is, that we, you know, the Chinese react the way they react because they've got to move however many million people it is into jobs every year or face just unbelievable social unrest. Mm -hmm. We react that way, even though, frankly, we don't have that concern. But so it's an, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting point. So I wouldn't describe the climate sort of scene that unfolded in Copenhagen as, as primarily a battle between the U S and China. I, you know what? I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on that. I mean, I agree that there were more actors involved, but I think the fascinating thing to me about how Copenhagen played out was that in the end, I mean, it was very clear that, that you know, first of all, the United States was actually quite adept, or quite adroit, I thought, after the conference at basically placing the blame on China for what happened. Um, and what's interesting is that the Chinese were very slow to react to this, and in the end, I don't think they actually succeeded in, in altering the media perceptions of this. The second is, is that I think there was genuine, you know, conflict uh, at Copenhagen. Now, I don't think this was necessarily the intent of either o Obama or Wen Jiabao, but it's clear the negotiators really had some serious set tos yeah. um, And, you know, based on what, what came out, uh, there was a fair amount of unpleasantness. Now, then you attach, you know, Mary, on top of this, the business of, with regard to Google in China, and the way the Chinese government has reacted, for example, to Hillary Clinton's speech last week about Internet freedoms. And I found this fascinating because, I mean, I watched that speech. And while it was true that Clinton mentioned China a couple times in terms of examples of Internet censorship, when she actually addressed the Google issue in particular, I, I've never seen, you know, more delicate tiptoeing around the, you know, uh, around the issue. Um, it was very clear she was soft-pedaling that. But the Chinese have reacted since then quite sternly on this issue. Well, it, it's interesting just on that because I have to say I am guilty of assuming that that speech would get no coverage and be kind of a nothing burger and, and, and nobody would, would really care. And I was completely wrong. And I think the most fascinating thing was that several folks in, in, at NSN went to an informal meeting with a group of, of Chinese bloggers yes. who, happened, who happened to be in Washington at, at the same time. Hmm. And, you know, frankly, um, they were even more cynical about the speech than I was and got there. And one of the Chinese bloggers said to the audience, that speech was like a song to my heart and like people were sort of, you know, getting moist eyed and so on. And that it really did have a profound effect on that segment of its targeted audience. That is the people who are actually, you know, under the most risk from all this, which after all is not Google, but sort of ordinary Chinese folks who are trying to use the internet to express their, their daily concerns. So I think that in part, um, the Chinese reaction is because that speech did did hit home in a way that I will certainly admit I, I wasn't wasn't expecting it to. Well, and, and and again that 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 this for China, it isn't a foreign policy issue for them. It's a domestic it's a domestic control issue, which ultimately is is the only issue in some ways that matters right. to the to the Chinese government. Like like our you know any administration in the U.S. has to win elections no matter what else happens. The Chinese government has to keep control of social unrest no matter what else happens. Well, this is my concern. I mean, I, you know, I wrote an article for International Security in the fall arguing that the, the sort of interdependent relationship between China and the United States was such that China actually couldn't, if, even if they wanted to, you know, use their financial leverage against the United States. But there was a cautionary note I put at the end, which is the problem is, is that with economic relationship, the economic relationship as opposed to the military one or the security one, domestic politics can sometimes be primor you know, much more yeah. important. And mm -hmm. so just as Obama is constrained on the domestic side in the United States, I think the Chinese leadership is constrained on their side as well. And so as a result, my concern is not so much that either side intentionally provokes the other, because I actually don't think that's been the case. I think that each side has accidentally badly provoked the other, though. And the problem is, these, you know, there is a snowball effect over time mm -hmm. on these things. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with that. But again, the, the other, the interesting thing is the economic relationship constrains the Chinese in two different ways, um, both in the way that you suggest, mm -hmm. but also um, in the way that, you know, as long as a fourth or a fifth of China's economy 
economic production is still going to Walmart. Oh, right, yeah. Um, the, the Chinese are both constrained. You know, they they need the relationship with us even as they need to get out from under the relationship with us. So, um, you know, sort of the sum, I think the sum of this conversation is, number one, it's actually not that much fun to be a Chinese leader. Um, number two, their situation is constrained in ways that are that are very different, I think, from how we're used to thinking about it. Um, how we're used to thinking about authoritarian leaders, yeah. Yes, yes. And number three, that, that as you point out, the the opportunity for sort of accidental, for miscalculation is is enormous. But, but I, and I, I would yield to people who are more expert on China than I am, but again, if you look at sort of the past history of stupid things that American and Chinese leaderships have done to each other, this has all actually been handled pretty calmly. Well, I like your sanguine. Uh, trust me, I, w- I want you know your sanguine approach to be correct. I I do think. <laughs> I, I guess I would put it this way. I I'm not sure that either side is used to the sort of stresses that we've been talking about recently. In other words, w- one of the problems is that these, in some ways, what's been happening is the whole category of relatively speaking newer issues has pushed their way to the fore. And I think it surprised. My guess is it surprised both the Chinese leadership and the U.S. leadership in terms of how, it, how it's affected the bilateral. Um, so I, I, just, I guess I worry about whether or not there are more surprises in store, things that neither side anticipates could, would be you know, uh, an issue that winds up becoming an issue. I mean, you're right. I, I mean, my, my hope is in some ways that cooler heads prevail, and I think if things really escalate out of control, one would assume that at the head of state level, you know, there would be a way to, to calm things down. The problem is, is that if they try to do that, that's going to exact political costs on both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, there's strong support in the United States for you know a tougher line on China, and I guarantee there's strong support within China for a tougher approach on the United States. So I guess I, I agree with you that probably in the end things will be you know not blow up, but that's going to exact an enormous political cost on both sides. Yeah. So so that I mean, cycling back to your original question about China and the State of the Union, yeah. you know, the challenge here is. Who the hell knows how to govern the relationship between the two powers when you've got a third power like Google, say, involved? <laughs> yeah. um, so that we're we're in a situation where nobody, you know, not us, not the Chinese, and not and not Google. And and by the way, the I just happened to be meeting with someone who used to be in Google management, and the whole story about how the, how this looks from Google's side is also completely fascinating. Yeah. And I think insufficiently, I mean, certainly insufficiently well understood by me, and probably insufficiently well understood by most people outside sort of the, the small group of people that follow Google very closely, but, but the extent to which they think of, I mean, in a political science modeling sense, you, you could do worse than to model Google as another government, and thinking of itself as another political actor. Mm-hmm. What's our economic benefit? What's our sort of strategic, moral, global positioning benefit mm-hmm. here? Um, well, I mean, and, you know, the I, New York Times basically, I mean, there was that front page story in the Times today about this, the question about cyber attacks, and it, it ends, this is always the case with New York Times articles, the, the last few paragraphs are always more interesting than the first few, but there was a yes. discussion about the fact that Google, by, you know, the, the U.S. government was bemoaning the fact that it didn't clearly have a deterrent, you know, weapon to deal with the kind of cyber attacks, whereas Google apparently did, which was they went public. <laughs> Um, so that, that, you know, and, and you're right, Google, you can treat as uh, a foreign policy actor in some ways. Although one of the things I think is interesting is the way in which the Chinese government is trying to marry Google to the U.S. government. That's a natural approach on yeah. their part, which is to say this isn't about Google. This is about, you know, uh, the U.S. economic nationalism or something. Right. Although um, that actually, uh, you know, in a way I think that will actually be good for the U.S. because it then forces – you're then forcing the Chinese public to choose between this fabulous internet tool and, you know, at Chinese nationalism, and it'll be it'll be interesting to see what what comes of that. This is this is where you and I might part ways. I, again, I hope you're right. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I don't mean to say I, I wish you're wrong, but it, mm-hmm. uh, I'll I'll bet on nationalism any day. Um, you know, I agree with you if pushed to if pushed to the to the nth degree. Yeah. No, you're you're definitely right, and it's good to it's good to call me on my my unexpected outbreak of Pollyannaism. <laughs> um, so, you know, if pushed to the ult, you know, c- c- would you start world? Would Google prevent World War One from starting? No, obviously not. Um, and and I I agree, but I, as long as we're not getting to that level, and I don't see signs that we are, then I think there's a it's a more complex effect. No, I agree, I agree with you on that. Um, and, and to some extent, I, 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 
it is interesting to note what Google's motivations were in terms of going public with this, in part because you could make the case that if they were truly and only concerned about economic, uh, you know, maximizing uh, sales and profits, they were probably better off keeping their mouths shut. I mean, I think what's yeah. interesting is that the the number of other software and hardware companies, um, internet companies that want to do business in China, have entirely backed away from supporting Google. The only ones who have, you know, sort of said, yeah, fight the power with Google are the ones who were shut out already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think... I think it's time. I think it's unavoidable that we have ground around to the point. I'm trying to c- come up with a, a connection a between sort of Google, Chinese communism, fight the power, and the Massachusetts election. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Yes. Well, I, you <laughs> know, here's you the threatened. thing. And, and we'll, we'll, this also goes to the, the sort of, you know, uh, dreams of, of, uh, of foreign policy ones. Do you wonder whether the Cosmo picture of Scott Brown is actually censored in China? How was that? Um, that's a good question. I would assume not. <laughs> um, I have to say, I, actually, what, what pops into my head is, I don't know if you saw this um, hilarious Taiwanese news station did an animation depicting its version of what happened between Tiger Woods and his wife that led to the famous SUV crash No, incident. I did not, actually. And so I'm trying to imagine, and I mean, that's Taiwan and not mainland China, but I am trying to imagine what the digital animation of the, uh, of the Massachusetts special election would look like <laughs> and feeling a little terrified by it. Well, I can imagine what the I don't know if the jib jab people are still around, but I'm sure they could come up with something. They they are, although they've never they've never re- reached the heights of their original production. Yeah. They they do things, but they're not anywhere near as funny as as that original one was, in in my opinion, anyway. But but you and I were we're getting up a we're we're getting up a promising disagreement um, in the in the pre in the pre show yes. um, sort of metaphysical green room, <laughs> um, where. Um, I said, well, of course, we agree that foreign policy didn't really have anything to do with what happened in Massachusetts. And you said, well, I'm not sure we agree. So, um, Well, I, it's not, it depends on what you mean by foreign policy. I mean, first of all, I, I, you're right in some extent, and I, I blog a little bit about this, in that, you know, for example, Scott Brown was the one, was the, the candidate who supported Obama's Afghanistan plan. Martha Coakley actually opposed it. Um, however, I do think, for, let me put it this way, I guess homeland security slash national security did play a role in two ways. First... Coakley did make a major blunder um, in saying at one point that I believe there were no terrorists in Afghanistan. There was no, you know, Afghanistan was not. No, she said there was no Al Qaeda right. in Afghanistan. Um, and actually. And you can argue that maybe that, you know, I mean, you could argue the Al Qaeda presence has been vastly exaggerated in Afghanistan. But, you know, that's the kind of thing where uh, it was very easy, I think, for Brown to paint her as being soft on security. And this actually ties into a, the second issue, which I do think was more important. And which um, a guy named Mark Thiessen has been uh, uh, blast faxing, or the the cyber equivalent of blast faxing everyone uh, for the last two weeks, which is to argue that Scott Brown was very vehement in support for the enhanced interrogation slash torture of the uh, of Captain Underpants, the the underwear bomber. It should immediately be noted that Mark Thiessen was a, you know worked for Jesse Helms and then was a speechwriter in the Bush White House. Um, was the chief speechwriter after Mike Gerson left, and thus has a very strong self interest in defending the idea that enhanced interrogation was a good I, idea. I certainly agree, but I'm also not entirely. Let me put it this way: I, I, I let, let's let's put to one side the merit, the the relative merits of doing that right. from a policy perspective. I think it's idiotic. I, I don't, and it was clear it wasn't. It was superfluous. I would add, and also, oh, by the way, morally repugnant. But let, let's hold that off to one side. I'm more interested in the political argument that Thiessen is making, and here he might actually be right, which is to say that when Scott Brown came out in favor of this, that might have helped, you know, boost him in the polls. And I mean, I'm sure you, you know, if you look at the public polling on this in terms of enhanced interrogation techniques, majority of Americans actually support it. Um, you know, if you take a look at the Pew poll, if you take a look, well, it totally depends how you ask the question. So, so but let's but let's back up. Okay. So, point one is if you look at the exit polling on Massachusetts, national security, um, terrorism, Afghanistan, terrorists in Afghanistan, none of that comes up in the sort of top three reasons people were gave for voting. Heather, for, wait, hold on. What exit polling? I didn't think there was exit polling. There, there the actually, yeah, there have been several. Um, there's a Hart one and a Rasmussen one. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll put the I'll, I'll put the links. All up. right. Up. There wasn't there wasn't exit polling that was available night up. Right. That's what I remember. So we yeah. all we all went through the evening chewing on our, our fingernails. <laughs> but but there was sort of post polling of, of voters. Okay. 
And not only did it not come up as one of the top three reasons when you were given reasons, when you were sort of allowed to free answer what made you what made you vote for him, yeah. um, it, it literally never came up. Okay. So so that I think you know that sort of should should comprehensively demolish the idea that the election was in any way a referendum on Obama's national security. Oh policy. well, all right. Now, all right. What I okay. do yeah. think is true, and where I am grudgingly compelled to admit that that you and, and Mr. Thiessen have a point, is that, you know, there is um, a swath of the American electorate that that uses sort of tough statements on national security as a surrogate for, as a surrogate for good judgment on national security. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a national security threshold, we, we like to call it. And there's definitely a group of voters, and they tend to be moderates or independents, where you've got to get over that national security threshold, even if they don't think that's why they're voting for you or against you. And, um, you know, unfortunately, just kind of saying unthinking, ineffective, and morally repugnant things about torture certainly puts you on, on the tough side of the tough guy scale. Right. And having... And I don't even think... It's necessarily, it has to be that you were opposing escalation in Afghanistan, but if you opposed it in a way that made it appear that maybe you didn't have your facts totally straight, yeah. and as you said, that you didn't take the al-Qaeda th- threat sufficiently seriously, I think that undermines your credibility. Um, and if you're a woman, it's much worse, by the way, mm-hmm. um, because you already come in with a you know, a little bit of a credibility gap with a certain group of voters. Yeah. And yes, you can find the statistics to back me up on that. Um, you know... You start, you sort of dig yourself in a little deeper and in a way that that the voter may never be able to consciously identify that that's why they voted against you. So I grudgingly acknowledge a certain certain truth to what you're saying. In your face, Herbert. Sorry. But damn it, if she'd been properly prepared as a candidate, none of it would have mattered. Um, You know, let's point out that, that her national security gaffes were really in some ways part of a whole wider set of gaffes that, that Coakley committed. Um, as someone who had to live through this election, you know, I, I would assert that in some ways the national security stuff, I agree with you. I, 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 let's, let's be clear. I'm not saying that, that um, national security concerns tipped that election under, under no circumstances. I think it was of a piece with a whole variety of other things. Um, and in some ways far worse than the, uh, the, the national security gaffes was the fact of, of Coakley's utter and complete total incompetence as a candidate uh, yeah. Particularly in the state of Massachusetts, dissing things like you know uh, shaking hands outside of Fenway Park and confusing Kurt Schilling with a Yankee yeah. fan. So yes, yeah. I was just grateful that I didn't have to go into a booth myself and pull the lever for someone who called Kurt Schilling a Yankee fan, yeah. even though I, I I know what she meant. I mean, he might as well be a Yankee fan. Oh, um, now come on, Heather, come on, you're a Red Sox. I, I know your your baseball affiliations. <laughs> You know. No, this was a great moment in our house because I'm married to a Yankee fan. Yes. And I said to my husband, That's it, it's official, you can have him now. <laughs> you and your you and your Republican felon owner can have can have Schilling now. It's official. You should now come on, you know, if you're a Red Sox fan, you know the tribal loyalties to the team surpass all political you know Yes, should, I know should overcome I know. all political that's, that's why this caused me this caused me so I mean, this caused me a lot of pain on those grounds and this causes me a lot of pain as someone who spends a lot of time putting together materials and briefings and other paraphernalia on issues that, you know, are available to candidates as well as, you know, part of, we, we, partisan and nonpartisan entities can use our stuff right. exactly to avoid this you know, sort of really massive Mongolian clusterfuck. Your phrase, not mine. Yes, I agree. But yeah, so no, I mean, since that is, I mean, kind of one of the things that is my life's work, it was, it was a little bit too much like watching a train wreck right outside your house. Well, I mean, I think, you know, Nate Silver, I think, had a post the, the day after, two days after, where, I mean, I, I tend to agree. Uh, look, there was a multi, this was a multi-causal outcome, um, you know, which I would say 40% was Coakley's incompetence as a candidate, 40% was the external economic situation, um, and then, you know, 20% factors unique to Massachusetts, among other things. Our vote, you know, the vote didn't, uh, there, there was no, in terms of the health care plan, um, Massachusetts already had one, so it didn't matter. Um, Which is better than the one the rest of us are going to get, by the way, even supposing we're going to get one. Well, that's, yeah, you know, I, again, uh, <laughs> you, you've, re- you've revealed against my complete and utter disinterest in health care as a public policy issue. It's always been my Achilles heel as a, as a wonk. No, I just revealed your standing as a tenured academic with a really good health care plan through your employer, so you never had to think about it. 
No, I've had to. Th- I, I've, I've thought about. I thought about it when I was a grad student, obviously. But it, it, you're right. I mean, that's that's another issue. I've, uh, you know, yet another uh, problem I've got with this sort of thing. Um, but okay, let's close now that you've completely embarrassed me as a heartless, uh, <laughs> selfish academic. Well, I actually have to give our viewers a brief apology because they will have noticed during this that my eyes strayed off to the side a couple of times, and there'll be mean, nasty, savage commentary in the about about my my disinterest in them or my lack of interest in them. And it's guys, it's not that at all. I just I wanted to make sure that my my twelve thirty interview hadn't shown up so that I was not dissing her in any way. <laughs> um, all right, let's let's close this quickly. I did want to say a word about Haiti. Um, Basically, the sort of, uh, you know, it's ironic that you were talking about the sort of, you know, we both talk about the limits on U.S. power, um, you know, in, in this in the 21st century. But one of the things that I, I, I'm amused by is that the sort of old-style conspiracy memes about how the United States really can do or say anything it wants continue to persist. And so I don't know if you've seen this, but, you know, news outlets and, and leaders, as it turns out, in Venezuela, Iran... Uh, and Russia, you know, have reported on accusations that the United States Navy triggered the earthquake in Haiti uh, intentionally. Um, now, why this is the case is a little unclear to me. I think Chavez argued that this was like a test case. Um, it, it was sort of a, a demonstration test, uh, and then the, the weapon will then be used against Iran. Um, and, by the way, if that's the case, well, I would obviously deplore the loss of life in terms of Haiti – awesome if we could actually use this, you know, to, to destroy Iran's nuclear program, but there would be massive loss of life, of course. I was going to say, it would kill a lot of people. It would people kill a lot of people. the nuclear yes, program. Yes, yes. Well, it depends how deeply the, the nuclear program is, is buried underground. Uh, but yes, you're right. It doesn't make, obviously this doesn't make a lot of sense. There is a, a Canadian think tank, um, someone posted something arguing that this was in fact triggered to rally the country, I believe, around Obama. And that you could tell that this was the case because he then dispatched George W. Bush and Bill Clinton to Haiti, um, you know, as a way to sort of demonstrate and build up national unity. And I, I do love these kinds of conspiracy theories because the, the you have to have the combination of Machiavellian brilliance and utter sheer stupidity in just the right proportions for it to make any sense whatsoever. Well, you know, there's there's two things. And one is it's actually a useful reminder of how what a thrall we hold over the rest of the world, yeah. right? I mean, which we forget about because we kind of know how much we're struggling and how much the economy is hurting and how how much people feel constrained. But that, that anybody in Venezuela or Iran would actually take the time to imagine that we control the movements of the of the plates of the planet, you know, that, that really, that should, that should be helpful for, for understanding just what a large place we still hold in the global public imagination for better and, and for worse. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing, you know, and this is like the kind of thing that my mother would say to me when I was a kid, but I think the good news here, if Chavez is spreading that kind of rumors about us, that means that the public diplomacy aspect of our aid response is very effective. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it means that it means that somebody need that there's something good happening that that, that Chavez and Ahmadinejad and, and Putin in his more mischievous moments feel that they want to try to counter, and that is a a resurgence of of you know people respecting the United States as the kind of country that will dig through the rubble eleven days to pull people out, right? So so in a in a crazy backwards way. Um, you look at it as we're coming out of a period where you didn't have to make up wacky stories about us because we were doing really wacky things. And now, you know, we're back at a point where people feel that we're actually crowding in on their PR space, and, and frankly, that's a good thing. I kind of like that. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. Uh, I, I hope that's the case. I'm kind of curious what the international perceptions are of the U.S. effort in Haiti. I mean, you know, obviously any tragedy where 200,000 people are estimated to die, uh, you know, can't be looked at as, as a success. On the other hand, you know, you have to judge that against what could have been done in an optimal situation. And frankly, it's not clear to me what could have been done better in terms of the the, the operations because of just the, the way things went. And I haven't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen any, you know, criticisms of the way the U.S. has managed yeah. it with the exception of that idiotic French minister. I don't know what that was about. But no, I mean, Haiti, I think it's pretty generally understood that Haiti just had such minimal infrastructure right. to begin with that... that I don't. I don't even know how you would start assessing what could have been done differently. Just one last. You're reminding me when I when I worked at the State Department ten years ago, um, I met this poor person whose job it had been for the better part of his career to rebut this persistent rumor that circulates in in developing countries that the U.S. was purchasing babies for organs. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, this there's you can see how the international adoption trade gave rise to that 
rumor, right. and it was clearly it was a thought to have also some roots in Soviet era Cold War dif- disinformation, and, and we frankly did the same kind of thing in reverse. And there was this one person whose job it was to rebut that, and that's all the person did all day. Interesting. I, I don't know if you know this. There was a bit. There's a, there was a big flap about a week ago um, because uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, bloggers caught hold. A, a paper was just published. Uh, it was co-authored by Adrian Vermeule and Cass Sunstein, who's in the administration, yeah. about the way to break up, you know, sort of conspiracies. That, and the argument is that the the U.S. government should actually place or infiltrate these kinds of closed-minded uh, conspiracy groups. And, of course, you know, everyone, the usual suspects came out and said, you know, this is awful and, and horrible. I, I mean, one does wonder whether you can do this thing effectively internationally, although one also wonders whether if you even try to do this effectively internationally, it would be therefore revealed and, of course, undercut the initial effort. Well, I mean, one wonders whether Vermeule and Sunstein are aware that we did do this kind of thing effectively during the Cold War and, and whether they, they made any effort to look at that and make any conclusions about whether it is or is not replicable in the sort of Internet open government age. But it is, it's a very Sunsteinian thought, if yeah. I may say so. Yeah. Well, on that thought, I think uh, you've got an interview or you've got a meeting and yeah. I have to get going. But uh, yeah. a pleasure as always, Heather. You too, and enjoy the State of the Union. Yes, you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.